Hello, Kristen Knudsen, Production Manager and Technical Director at the College Light Opera Company, coming to you from the Highfield Theatre. Behind the Scenes with Kristen Knudsen is made possible by a generous gift from Clyde Tyndale and Deb Winograd. I've got to duck down a little bit to avoid these ropes. I'm above the pin rail on the stage, and this episode, our final episode of the summer, is all about rigging. I'm going to specifically talk quite a bit about rigging in a hemp house, which is what we are. I do want to demonstrate how to tie some common knots, very useful things for working in theatrical rigging. But first, let's talk a little bit about some history. Let's learn about where some terminology we use on stage comes from. It's not 100% true to claim that theatrical rigging was born out of nautical rigging. They certainly share a lot of technology and terminology, but theatrical rigging can be traced back at least as far as the days of ancient Greek theater, and the sort of nautical rigging we associate with modern theater practice has only been in use for a couple centuries. Thanks to a well-known superstition, it's generally accepted that there was a period of time when former or off-duty sailors would work as riggers and stitchers for theaters, since they had extensive experience with knotting rope and sewing up sails. Story goes, these riggers would communicate with whistles as they would on a ship, and a person on stage whistling a random tune might inadvertently signal for a piece of scenery to come crashing down on their head. I honestly cannot find any historical examples to back this up, but the superstition that whistling on stage is unlucky has prevailed. In any case, the presence of sailors on a rigging crew would certainly result in the adoption of nautical terminology over time. While I do believe the language of theater rigging was heavily influenced by the vocabulary of ship's rigging, it's far more accurate to say both technologies evolved from a common ancestor, so to speak. But let's quickly touch on some of the rigging terms you might hear in either context. In the theater world, a baton is a suspended pipe or bar upon which scenery, soft goods, or lighting instruments might be flown. In the nautical world, the term baton refers to a thin bar or strip of lumber, usually in reference to a support within a sail, but sometimes in reference to the strips of lumber making up the ship's hull. Belaying is securing or fastening down, often with the use of a cleat or belaying pin, which we will talk about shortly. In rigging terms, a block is a pulley. Blocks might be stationary, mounted to a surface, or they might hang from a hook or eye, allowing them to pivot or swivel. You might also hear these referred to as shivs, a term which actually refers to the grooved wheels within pulley blocks. A piece of hardware very common on stage and on ships, a cleat is a wooden or metal fitting with projecting arms around which rope or line can be wrapped and secured. The term purchase refers to a mechanical hold or advantage. A single purchase system is one for one. A rope attached to a load goes up over a single pulley and down to the operator. If the operator pulls the rope one foot, the load raises one foot. A double purchase system incorporates a second pulley at a fixed line, and your load travel is halved or doubled depending on how you set it up. If the double purchase is on the operating end, the load will travel twice as fast but will require twice the force to be lifted. If the operator pulls the rope one foot, the load will raise two feet, but it takes double the effort. However, if you set up the double purchase on the load end, the load will travel half as fast and require half the force. If the operator pulls the rope one foot, the load will only raise six inches, but with much less effort. To trim is to make an adjustment. In theater, it usually means leveling out a batten or setting a flown piece at its performance position. A batten's in trim is its lowest position during the show, and the out trim is its highest position, which may not actually be set at the extreme height of the rigging system. We call that gridding a pipe, when you have taken a batten as high as the building structure and the rigging system will allow. And then we arrive at the pin rail, which looks and behaves quite the same in both the theater and nautical world. On a ship, the pin rail is a wood or steel railing that holds a series of wood or steel belaying pins, which helps secure ropes used to adjust rigging. In a theater, the pin rail is a sturdy wood or steel beam on one side of the stage where the ropes that control flown line sets are secured, sometimes elevated on a catwalk to be clear of the stage wing. The use of a pin rail with removable belaying pins is one of the few truly nautical crossovers. Theaters were using fixed cleat rails long before adopting the loose belaying pin style of rail, and such cleat rails were rarely found on ships. Based on offerings and very old theatrical rigging catalogs, the pin rail made its first appearance on stage around 1850. The Highfield Theatre is a hemp house. 
The term hemp house originates from the use of natural hemp rope in the very early days of theatrical rigging, but today it simply means any rigging system that employs a fiber rope. Traditionally, that would be manila rope, but synthetic fiber ropes made with polyesters have become more popular thanks to their longevity. They don't rot in damp environments, and they're far less susceptible to stretching and shrinking due to humidity. Synthetic ropes can become brittle when exposed to too much UV light, but that's really not an issue in theater, where the stage environment is dark or artificially lit most of the time. With all varieties of rope, you do need to take care not to allow dirt to become embedded in the fibers. Tiny abrasions from particulates can weaken and wear out a rope quickly. It was well past time for a rope change out at the Highfield Theater, so we took the opportunity to refresh the system. The oldest lines in service were synthetic braided rope installed decades ago. Some lines had previously been changed out to twisted multi-line rope, and while they do show some age, we expect to get a few more years out of them. In general, the old ropes were cut a little too short to allow battens to easily come to a rest on the stage floor. So even the multi-line we kept in service was removed and reinstalled one pick point closer to the pin rail, allowing us to trim them to an ideal working length. Brand new rope was installed on the far stage left pick point, which is the longest run of line. Then we completely replaced all of the old braided rope with new half-inch multi-line. Now the entire system operates on the same type of rope, and all of the pick points to the battens have been re-spotted and neatly tied. Let's take a little closer look at our multi-line. This half-inch multi-line too is a three-strand twisted rope. Although it strongly resembles cotton rope, the outer surface is actually spun polyester, which provides a good grip while remaining soft enough not to tear up your hands. The paired orange markings on the exterior of the rope are an identifier for this variety of multi-line. Each of the three strands is polyester wrapped around a polyolefin core that helps provide rigidity. Polyolefin is a category of polymer, the most common of which is polyethylene and polypropylene. If we pick apart the strand to reveal this core, you'll discover colored yarns that indicate the fiber content of this rope based on industry standards. Blue indicates polyester, which we know is the exterior material of this rope, and the other strand, well, honestly, I can't quite tell if it's meant to be red or a very deep orange. If it's red, it means our core is made of polypropylene. If it's orange, it means our core is made of polyethylene. Our battens are standard inch and a half Schedule 40 steel pipe, very common in theaters and easily sourced. Schedule 40 comes in 21 foot lengths, so these have been spliced together to create approximately 35 foot battens. One high field batten pipe weighs about 95 pounds. Lighter weight aluminum pipe is sometimes used in venues, but you sacrifice a lot of rigidity and face greater risk of bent pipes from heavy loads. Each of our battens takes three picks, with the exception of the upstage most line set, which is set up with four. On most of these battens, you'll notice a side arm bar attached vertically beside the center pick point. The rope is lashed off to this arm with tie line, which helps discourage rotation of the batten pipe itself. Our rope picks are tied directly to the batten using a clove hitch followed by two half hitches to prevent the clove hitch from loosening. Let's examine this knot a little closer. A half hitch is simply an overhand knot, like you'd use when beginning to tie your shoelaces, but with an object passing through the loop it forms. Could be a pipe or the rope itself. 
not a strong knot on its own, but used as a component of many others. Here's what two half hitches look like. You tie two in succession in the same direction, and you'll notice that the loose tail gets cinched between the knots. The clove hitch is a really simple knot that's easy to cinch around an object and also very easy to remove when needed. There are a few different ways to prepare this knot, and the best method really depends on your application and what is easiest for you to remember. Let me show you how I personally tie this knot. This railing will be our imaginary pipe batten. We're going to toss the dead end or loose end of our rope over top of the railing. When I pull it back up and over, I make sure it forms an X over the first loop. Coming around once more, now I thread the loose end directly underneath the X, slipping the rope between the two previous loops. I can pull and manipulate both ends to tighten the hold and adjust where the knot lays. Now I follow my clove hitch with two half hitches around the load side of the rope, making sure to tie them in the same direction. These half hitches might look familiar to those of you who made knotted friendship bracelets as a kid. Let me show you again from another angle. From the underside, your clove hitch will just look like two parallel lines passing under your batten, or in this case, railing. Now we know how to hang our batten using the clove hitch. Let's look at the operating end of the rope by the pin rail and talk about lashing off or belaying. In general, the high field does not make use of any counterweight. Usually a hemp system would utilize sandbags to give the operator an advantage. And while we might set up a special rig when needed, we really don't have space at the pin rail to accommodate sandbags. So when you haul out a line here, you are directly hauling out the weight of the pipe, rope, and anything attached to that batten. For safety, we operate line sets with a minimum of two crew members, one to do the heavy work of hauling on the ropes, and one to keep a bite on the rail and take up slack, serving as a safety that prevents the line from running if the person hauling were to lose their grip. A 95-pound batten is already pretty heavy for the average person to manage, so really hefty loads require multiple crew members both at the floor and sometimes above on the catwalk. On our rail, the rope falls behind the rail closer to the wall, simply because we have a very narrow gap above between the balcony and the wall itself. So a lot of diagrams will show you going ahead and pulling it to the front, but honestly, that would probably put a lot of strain on the rope and wear a lot faster. I've hung a short length of rope off of a cleat on the wall. Now this is not a line set. There's no batten attached to this. There's no weight. It's just a rope hanging off the wall close to an empty pin so I can demonstrate how we secure a line set. I wanna show it to you from a couple different angles. When you secure your lines around the belaying pin, you are essentially creating a figure eight looping over each end of the pin. But to keep that figure eight from slipping, you need to put a turn in your top loop so the loose end becomes cinched when you pull that loop downward over the pin. Now, what I'm demonstrating is the lashing method used here at the high field. There are several ways to do this, all slight variations on the same idea. Your first wrap over or under the rail and around the pin takes the weight of the flown piece. When you let a batten in toward the stage, you keep these wraps in place so you have control over the rate of descent. When lashing off, the figure eight wraps simply secure the hold and prevent slipping.
During our rope swap, we wanted to mark our ropes with pieces of colored yarn to help operators keep track of which rope belongs to which pick. In order to take tension off the lines and allow this work to happen, we decided to set up one of our trim clamps. Now the bolts do have a little habit of trying to fall out. And it does matter which bolt goes where. And the reason it matters is when we flip it over, you'll see that particularly that bolt has been notched mm. to fit all the way down in there and clear oh. that bolt. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we take them over here. Just, Peter, hold that like that. That is proper order. Okay. Yeah, you've got that guy? I have done this single-handed. It can be very entertaining. <laughs> now, the way the poles work, once we start getting it tightened up, you can pull an individual line down through it so that you can level everybody out. Mm -hmm. Or you can take the entire block and push it upward. Gotcha. It so the rope will move one way through it, but not the other. Right. Okay. That's what the poles do. And so... The first step to get these all finger tighted down and the bolts all in the right place. So it takes the trick now is to get the falls sort of to lay down a little bit. You can see the angle, they're very much that way. Uh -huh. You really want to get them an angle more like that. Okay. So the way to do that is sequentially tighten up a bit. Push the thing up. Push up a little bit, which will tend to pull the poles gotcha. in the right way. And once they're sort of operating in the right direction, then they, as you tighten, they'll tend to lay out and they sort of tighten equal amounts on the two sides. Tension. I did. And I probably can't take any more on it because this guy is all the way up, except maybe in the center line. So I can just individually oh, pull one yeah, line yeah. <clears throat> so that you can do a really careful trim. Yeah. And then if you want a sandbag, hang one there. Yeah. Hang one here. And the trick there is usually you tie off these lines to the low position. Yeah, so it never goes in further. And on here with your sandbag, you have a grab rope mm -hmm. that hooks onto something in the set high position. Yeah. And nobody even has to fool with it. Let's pop up onto the catwalk and take a closer look at the head blocks and loft blocks. The loft block is the pulley directly above the load, which redirects the rope toward the control side of the stage. Here at the Highfield Theatre, our system is completely underhung, which simply means that all of the equipment is mounted below the walking level of the overstage grid. Our stage left and stage right pick points pass through loft blocks permanently mounted to large structural beams. These LVL beams, or laminated veneer lumber, are an engineered wood product specifically designed for strength and stability over long spans. Our center pick points are mounted higher, fixed to the grid support structure with lengths of chain. While still technically loft blocks in this system, these center pulleys are individual shivs often referred to as chafers, which is just a brand name of nautical grade rigging, similar to calling tissues Kleenex. They can swivel, which can be very beneficial for aligning a system, but problematic if you use rope that likes to twist up on itself. Here I'm giving a little tug on each line so you can see which pick point they control.
The head blocks are mounted to the wall directly above our pin rail and redirect the ropes toward the floor. This is where all the lines supporting a batten are grouped so the operator can grab them all together. Some of these head blocks are built as units with multiple shivs within, and some are individual shivs mounted side by side. The rope lines slip down between the wall and the catwalk. The fit is a little tight, plenty of space for the rope itself, but not a lot of clearance for movement. It makes counterweight difficult and the ropes tend to scrape against the edge of the catwalk when operators are actively flying scenery in or out. We do have an edge guard in place to reduce the friction on the ropes, but we need to keep an eye out for excessive rope wear in this area. Here's a great comparison of our older multi-line next to the brand new rope we just installed. While we're up here, let's go ahead and pop up into the overstage grid. There's space in the peak of the roof for technicians to move about and check or adjust rigging or run electrical cables, provided their arm is thin enough to get through the three inch gaps between the two by four planked flooring. There aren't any real obstructions on the floor since our rigging is all below this level. In many theaters, the loft blocks are mounted on the top side of the grid floor, both for ease of access and to maximize potential fly height. This is actually an exceptionally safe setup. It's impossible for a person to fall through thanks to the tight spacing. But as always, when working overhead, empty your pockets so you don't accidentally lose objects and risk hitting a fellow technician or actor. If you need to bring tools with you to the grid, make sure they're tethered to you with a lanyard or a length of line. I only brought my phone up here to film because I knew nobody was on the stage below me. For those curious, here's the inside of the high-field cupola. It's dead center over the stage, and the vents are still winterized with foam insulation, since we never bothered to open it up this summer. It does usually function as ventilation during normal clock operations. I want to show you a couple more essential knots. Beyond the clove hitch, I would say the bowline is the second most utilized knot on most stages. It creates a nice strong loop to attach to a load, but it's easily untied when needed. The bowline can be tied in a variety of ways, and I know for myself, I have to visualize it in a very specific orientation to avoid confusion. I always hold the long or control end of the rope in my left hand and the tail that will form the loop in my right. Make a turn in the rope to create a small loop. The tail end of the rope should be crossing on top of the control end of the rope as that loop is formed. Pass the tail end through the small loop from behind, pull it through a bit, then pass the tail under the control end of the rope. Turn and pass the tail through the small loop again, front to back, making sure you're heading out the same way you came in. Now, as you tighten the knot, you'll see that the control end of the line has been cinched hard against your small loop. It's also possible to tie a bowline one-handed, though that's a skill that has eluded me until today. I decided to attempt it for your amusement, so I watched some demonstration videos. Most examples start by wrapping the rope behind your back and holding tension on the control end with your non-dominant hand while you tie the knot. But I found this video showing what appears to be a truly one-handed approach, so I made this my goal. Oh no. Ah, whoa. Ah, <laughs> if at first you don't succeed. Finally, I was able to consistently, though slowly, tie a one handed bowline. The last knot I want to show you is more of a utility knot for joining flat webbing the water knot. The flat webbing in this demonstration is not the sort intended for rigging use. You would instead use lengths of tubular webbing for rigging and truck loading applications. The water knot is an excellent way to join two lengths of webbing or to join the ends of a single length into a loop. You start with an overhand knot near the end of one of your webbing pieces. Don't tighten it just yet. Manipulate the knot until it can collapse flat. You may have to take a couple twists out of one end to achieve this. 
Now with your second piece of webbing, neatly weave your way through the existing knot backwards so you have two layers of webbing stacked and a tail emerging on the other end. Make sure everything is able to collapse flat, and then pull in both directions to cinch the knot tight. If you ever want to undo this knot, you just need to hold the webbing on either side of the knot itself and push inward. This knot's great for forming strong loops of webbing because the outward pressure of any load pulling on the loop simply tightens the knot. If you love learning new knots or are just fascinated by watching other people tie them, I highly recommend you visit animatednots.com. They have demonstrations for so many knots. You can speed up or slow down the animation as well as flip or mirror the image so you can view it in an orientation that makes sense to you. And each knots page includes great information about the uses of that particular knot, other names it may go by, alternate versions, and warnings about ways that knot can fail. This episode focused entirely on high field specific rigging, but there's a lot more out there. This system is not all that common anymore. If you want to spend some time educating yourself about rigging with steel wire rope, counterweight systems, or working with motorized rigging, I recommend picking up a copy of the Stage Rigging Handbook written by J. O. Glarum, published by Southern Illinois University Press. I have this third edition, which is the newest, released in 2007. That's quite a long time ago already, but it's a fantastic resource written in very plain language with helpful diagrams and charts explaining the physics in much greater detail than I had time for today. Now, before we wrap up this final episode, I wanna give you one more look at the incredible progress on construction of our new rehearsal hall. It's like a building has popped up overnight, totally unrecognizable from the images that I shared with you early in the summer. As always, thank you for joining me today and thank you for being with me all summer. Behind the Scenes with Kristen Knutson has been part of our larger series, Digital Clock. Digital Clock is made possible by a generous gift from Phil and Liz Gross. If you want to learn more about our programming or how you can become a supporter, please visit us at collegelightoperacompany.com. Now, while this may be the end of scheduled behind the scenes content for the summer, I do want you to keep a close watch on the Clock Facebook page. There are so many maintenance and improvement projects happening both here at the High Field and on campus, not to mention construction of a totally new rehearsal hall, which is super exciting and fun to look at. I want to keep you in the loop. So I anticipate into the fall, it won't be on a regular schedule, but I will try to post short five minute segments with updates on projects to social media whenever something is completed here that's worth sharing with you. So keep in touch with us. Please enjoy the rest of our programming this week, and here's hoping for a normal 2021 season. Knock on wood. 
Stay safe.